Hello, this is Petra and you are watching WellCode and in this video Jan has come from the future and we're gonna talk about quantum computing which is the third hottest subject in computer science after machine learning, JavaScript frameworks and then it comes quantum computing. So he's here in LA, he's an internet Google, he works on very very interesting things and we're gonna talk about quantum computing. But before going into that, can you please tell us more about yourself? What are you doing? Um, your background? Yeah, my name's Ian. Um, so I'm originally Canadian from Toronto um, and uh, I guess moved to the States or I did my undergrad at Toronto in physics and then moved to the States to continue my PhD in physics at Harvard. Um, and this is actually my second internship at Google. Um, my first was also with this group in the quantum computing or uh, the Google Quantum AI Lab uh, here in LA. Awesome! So you did you you are at the, one of the best schools possible. You did physics, and then you combine physics with computer science to basically work on creating the future. I know it sounds buzzwordy, but it's really interesting like watch till the end because you'll find out a lot of very interesting things things w which you don't hear a lot of times from the internet so before before going into what what you're working on um, can you explain more about what quantum computing is why is it important and how did it became such a like um, how to say such a popular thing and everyone everyone seems to be talking about it even if someone knows about it or not these days they still say oh quantum computing <gasps> so I guess I'll start off with the importance um I, I guess the basic thing with quantum computing is that it, it gives us some kind of power to um, compute basically to compute things that we can't compute with a regular classical computer um, and so there's some examples that people are you know, more familiar with than others. Like there are things we can do like um, Shor's algorithm, for example, for factoring very large numbers that we can't do with a regular classical computer. Um, yeah, and, and so people, yeah. Yeah, so uh, finding, uh, factoring very large numbers is important for uh, breaking uh, HTTPS and lots of cryptographic algorithms. So basically, if if we manage to do that, and are we able to read all the com communications <laughs> on the internet? So there are some things that we can break. Um, yeah. So I, I guess yeah, people definitely hear quantum computing from this scary side of uh, breaking cryptography based on factoring. Um, so there's some things that you can crack with the ability to do this, but um, there are some. I guess more modern um, cryptography approaches that you can't actually break even with a quantum computer. So we will get some potentially interesting things like maybe some secrets from the 80s or you can also have things like, mm -hmm. I guess a lot of short term things that you don't need to be secure for a very long time. Like mm -hmm. I guess I think banking transactions, for example, yeah. are done with these mm -hmm. um, things that you could attack with a quantum computer. But hopefully by the time we actually have such a large quantum computer that you could um, break these things they'll uh, improve the security systems mm -hmm. so i think in, in those terms there will be things that that are revealed like i would imagine some of these things like you know state secrets from the 80s or something could be a kind of weird thing mm -hmm. um but i don't think it's something i don't think that's the way that quantum computing will change the world mm -hmm. yeah yeah probably the most like uh, mo most communications would be just like stored data by the NSA of regular people brow browsing the internet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, you're saying that you can like break uh, cryptographic uh, algorithms, because uh, cryptographic like encoding, uh, because you can f uh, factor out primes. What else can you do with it? So yeah, one of the other examples that um you know, that I prefer talking about, partly because I work on it, um, is actually simulating quantum systems. Um, so a big part of my PhD and actually um, the work that I'm doing for my internship here at Google as well um, is on developing uh, algorithms, essentially programs that you could run on a quantum computer um, for simulating uh, quantum systems that you couldn't simulate completely on a classical computer. So there are a lot of interesting things like um, models of how uh, superconductors work or um, what are some superconductors okay so superconductors are systems that um 
basically uh, that you can use as like, for example, a wire that can conduct conduct electricity with no energy loss. Mm -hmm. So the regular wires for power transmission um, have resistance in them, which means that as you go along, as you cover some amount of distance, you necessarily lose some of the energy going through that wire. Mm -hmm. um, but for a superconductor, they have a bunch of other interesting properties, but one of them is that they actually don't lose uh, this energy that you, or they don't have this resistance mm -hmm. that you have in a regular uh, wire. Mm -hmm. um, and so for this, you could imagine doing things like power transmission without any loss of energy. Um, and it's kind of, it's a very futuristic goal. So people imagine, well, the current superconductors they've discovered so far all only work at extremely low temperatures. So, mm -hmm. so something like, at North Pole. well, even colder than that. Um, oh, okay. Much colder than that, actually. So right now, superconductors are like prototypes, which are not like useful for like large scale. Like we, you don't have superconductors going around LA, but uh, quantum computing will help us simulate about uh, about how they can work in different environments. Am I, did I understand it? Yeah, so quantum computing won't necessarily give us like this long uh, held dream of a room temperature superconductor, something that superconducts at room temperature. Um, but it'll definitely help us, or hopefully help us, get a better understanding of how superconductors actually work. Um, and this is something that actually, actually, yeah, quite a few people in the Google group have done work on. Right now, if you look at the news and you search, okay, quantum computing, you'll see all those articles which prom promise that everything will get changed, computer science will be turned upside down, and they, they are very popular and people start talking about quantum computing even if they know even if they don't so where is the reality and what's the reason for for this high popularity yeah so definitely a lot of it is hype um i don't think it's i don't think it's the case that quantum computing will you know completely change computer science by any means like you will still have to go through the regular kind of undergrad yeah. classes and but still it it would be fun like 20 years from now or 100 years from now you're watching this video and there are humans uh, war against cyborgs and <laughs> <laughs> which were enabled by quantum computing and you're just saying oh humanity you don't need to worry and then your children will be like <laughs> attacked by cyborgs yeah hopefully hopefully my work doesn't lead to you know terminator becoming reality or anything like that um i think the areas where we where we will have some like real improvements or real major impact um, are things like materials development. So there are a couple big examples, things like um, developing better batteries, I think is a really big one, um, or other ones like uh, better uh, catalysts for carbon capture. So for example, um, in the exhaust of your car, um, you know, yeah, your, the exhaust from your car comes out and it goes through this big pipe and part of that is the muffler, but there are also things in there that are used to capture uh, the emissions that would otherwise be coming out of the car. Mm -hmm. um, so you can imagine this, you know, not just on your car, but even like kind of on a broader scale. Um, you can imagine, imagine developing these materials that have the ability to basically take carbon dioxide out of the air or take the carbon out of the air like that. And make uh, the world clean again, yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is the kind of things that we hope... Um, you know, not necessarily in the next 10 or the next 20 years necessarily to develop using quantum computers or aided by quantum computers. Um, but things that, you know, maybe, well, who, who knows how long, maybe, maybe 20 years down the road, maybe 50 years down the road that we should be able to actually work on. Yeah, so basically before having Terminators kill us, <laughs> we'll have phones which don't die after one day and we'll have a clean award again which is one thing like I, I i would really want it's the climate's changing so fast like when when i was young like i i used to see snow every year now it's once per year before that was way often but yeah let's let's not start to talk about climate change um yeah it's it's amazing it, if that would be possible it's it's great and all the hype is worth so What's actually a quantum computer? How does it work? If you can explain that without going into too much physics, um, how is it different to a regular computer? So, I think the way that I the way that I usually like to explain this is that I think there are really like three um, key elements to a quantum computer, um, and each of them. 
the two, well, the first two more than the third are really like the buzzwordy things that you kind of hear about uh, quantum computing. So the three things are superposition, entanglement, and interference. So of those three, first of all, superposition is the one that I guess people hear the most about um, and that I guess in some sense is also the most misunderstood. Um, so superposition is this idea that instead of just having um, instead of just having like zero or one on the quantum computer, that you can actually have a superposition of like different combinations of these states. So you, you don't just have zero or one, but you can actually have a little bit of both at the same time. Um, oh, you mean like imagining a plan where one axis is zero, another axis is one, and like how much do you go on both, and then you end up with a point? Yeah, exactly. So. The actual, yeah, the, the way that's actually thought about, I guess, most commonly in physics is actually as a sphere. So you don't just have, the reason for it being a sphere is that you actually have two dimensions. You have, like, the ability to have real superpositions, but also complex, uh, or superpositions with complex components as well. Um, so this allows you to have, like, a full sphere where you could have, you know, zero is up, one is down, and then you can go through the full sphere and you can have like a superposition zero plus one, you can go the other way and have zero minus one. Mm -hmm. And then if you go in the other axis, you actually have complex numbers. You could have zero plus I times one or zero minus I times one. So and then you can have the full. So four dimensions? Um, I mean, it, it, I guess I would really say it's, it's two dimensions. So you have like, you have the axes of the sphere. So you could have, z you, you have, you have two degrees of freedom essentially mm -hmm. um, because you're constrained to still be on the surface of the sphere. Um, mm -hmm. So that's superposition. Um, the second big one is entanglement. Um, and entanglement basically says that instead of just having, um, like, like on a classical computer, you think of having your bits just kind of, each bit is set to an individual value. Like you have zero, one, say you, yeah, say you have two bits and you can have zero as one bit and one as the second bit. Um, but on a quantum computer, you can actually have these like entangled superpositions of these states. So basically you, you can store that. Yeah, but this doesn't actually give you, um, this sounds like it would give you more power, but by itself it doesn't actually give you much more than even actually a regular classical computer. Um, but so on a quantum computer you can have zero, one, plus one, zero as a state. So what that means is that if I give you this state and you measure the quantum computer, um, or you measure one qubit of that state, then you actually change in some way, or not really change, but collapse the state of the second qubit. So if you measure the first qubit when you have zero, one plus one, zero, if you measure zero on the first qubit, then you know for sure that the second qubit is one, even without actually measuring it. And if you measure one on the first qubit, then you know for sure that the second qubit is zero. So you have in some way this like... Uh, Basically keeping the points on the sphere? In this case, you can't really think of it as a sphere because you've gone to two qubits. Um, okay. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. But you have this, you, in some sense, you have these like... Uh, you have like a system? You have this kind of like years? link between the qubits that you wouldn't have in a classical setting. Okay. Um, so I guess, yeah, with... The key thing with, is with one qubit, you have this kind of sphere picture where you can say zero and one. Um, with two qubits, the problem is that you have too many dimensions to have this like clean sphere picture. Like mm -hmm. you have all the four possible... Um, different bit strings that you have with two bits. You have mm -hmm. zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. So you can't really just think of this as like a sphere anymore mm -hmm. because you have too many dimensions. You have four dimensions. Okay. Um, but so entanglement is, entanglement is this property that you can um, kind of have like a link between qubits. Mm -hmm. So, so you basi can have basically th the first one uh, has an impact on the next ones. Yeah. So yeah, so I mean, uh, like that's uh, yeah, that's definitely one. Yeah, it's definitely one way you can think of it. So it's like you can have a state that's like not just zero zero, but you can actually have a superposition of zero zero and one one. Um, and what that means is that if you actually measure the qubits, if you measure one of the qubits as zero, you know that the other qubit is also zero. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of link essentially between the two qubits. Mm -hmm. um, so in some sense, that's the second thing that gives yeah. quantum computers their power. So if you didn't study enough math, now is the time. If you want to do quantum computer, if you, if you want to do quantum computing, if you want to build cyborgs who will protect you and bring you food and clean your room, you have to go back and learn math in order to be able to, to work on uh, quantum computing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had to pay attention a lot compared to the other interviews.
just to be able to follow up and see how much I understand. And I suppose there, there's more advanced math behind that. Yeah, so yeah, there definitely is a lot of, a lot of your physics undergrad will be math-based there. And I mean, in some sense, a lot of what I do is still largely, I guess, linear algebra is really a big part of what I do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, so now can you continue with the third thing? Yeah. So yeah, the third thing that really, um, I guess that really combined with the other two is the essential ingredient uh, is interference. So I said before for this entanglement example, zero, zero, plus one, one, but really the key thing that gives quantum computers their full power uh, is the ability to have minus signs as well. Uh, and not just minus signs, but as well as minus signs, these like, like complex internally? superpositions. Yeah. So, well, so, so, so basically, you have all those weird positions, and then plus that you also have signs. Exactly. Yeah. So, so pro probably the sign, the, the 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 positions are more like difficult to have there, but the signs are also good bonus. Yeah. So this, that's actually a really interesting point. Um, and actually, if you if you don't actually have the signs, like if you only have. Um, like superpositions with plus mm -hmm. signs, then you can actually simulate that with a classical computer, which is something that usually when people just mention superposition and entanglement, that they wouldn't actually say. But so actually without interference, without the ability to have these um, signs, like minus signs as well, um, it's actually something, you can actually simulate a quantum computer that only has plus signs mm -hmm. with a classical computer. Yeah, but won't it uh, need more memory? Because you would actually think so, but it, it actually wouldn't. So there are there are there are actually ways um, there are actually ways basically with randomized algorithms that you can simulate a quantum computer that doesn't have minus signs as well. But yeah, so the the key third thing is is interference, the ability to have uh, these minus signs or complex numbers as well, um, and that's what allows you to actually get this. For example, like a big thing people would talk about is constructive and destructive interference with a quantum computer. So what you want to do. Um, you want to have this constructive interference, uh, essentially where the correct answers all add up their probabilities together, um, and the incorrect answers all have their probabilities cancel out by having different signs. Um, and basically, if this happens, then essentially your, your probability of getting the correct answer hopefully goes close to one, and your probability of measuring an incorrect answer goes close to zero. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's actually the combination of interference together with uh, superposition and entanglement that gives quantum computers their power. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, without yeah without all three, you don't actually have the full power of a quantum mm -hmm. computer. Okay, so so basically, uh, from what you explained, uh, quantum computers are more like a mathematical system of uh, of concepts which are linked together and which makes sense and because they make sense they're constructed that way you can use that kind of mathematical theory to to simulate what you said earlier and in or in order to be able to simulate that now you have physics which helps you with finding I don't know I, I was very bad at physics but I, I I'm just imagining that that thing helps you um, like you, you find some materials who have the, pro the the properties which are needed by the uh, mathematical system did I understand it correctly or am I far let's think um, so are you talking about for are you talking about for building a quantum computer or for the yes. side of okay so for the side of yeah, for the side of building a quantum computer, um, yeah, essentially we, we need systems that do have um, properties that we can kind of match to a qubit. So we need something that basically has, um, like in some sense, two states that we can link or that we can label as like the zero and the one states. Um, but we also need the system to have the ability to basically like preserve these signs uh, when we actually set the state up using whatever system we're using for the qubit. Um, so I guess you need something where you need something where you have the ability to kind of link these uh, like configurations of the system somehow to the qubit zero and one states um, and then also have the ability, for example, I guess interaction is a big problem. So you can't, you can't just have one qubit by itself mm -hmm. because for a quantum computer, you need hundreds or thousands or maybe tens of thousands 
of qubits to actually do Perfect. something interesting. Okay. So you need you need the ability to have these systems interact, and that's, in some sense, I think that's really the biggest problem for quantum computers right now. So people have really developed quite a few different systems that you could use for a single qubit. Um, and I think the challenge at this point is not just linking them up, not just going from one qubit to two qubits, which is something for many systems we've already done, but going from two qubits to 10 qubits to 50, mm -hmm. um, while still maintaining the ability to like, actually have the qubits not totally lose their state in different ways. Um, so and where are we right now? How many qubits does the best quantum computer in the world have? So qubits as a number by itself is not, you know, is not exactly the target that we want. So there's some systems uh, or there's some companies that have worked out things with you know, thousands of qubits. Um, but the number of qubits isn't the only um, way that we would determine quality for a quantum computer. Um, the second thing that I've kind of like, alluded to a little bit but haven't talked about is coherence. So that's really, in some sense, uh, you know, how well you can maintain um, a quantum state with the qubits. So there's this trade-off really in most platforms that people have developed where as you have more and more qubits, you tend to have a much harder time uh, maintaining coherence on the quantum computer. What's coherence? Um, you mean obtaining the same results or when at each, every run? or um, Basically not having, not losing the state in some way uh, is the kind of simple explanation. You mean like compared to a classical computer not having a crash? Yeah, so, so one of the big examples would be with superposition. Say I put a whole bunch of my qubits in this superposition of 0 and 1. Mm -hmm. um, one way of losing coherence would be to collapse either into 0 or 1. And so then you can kind of clearly see that I've, I've lost the superposition that I used to have. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is one of the different ways of losing coherence. You've, you've really kind of lost the quantum state that you hoped or thought you had. Um, so that's one of the challenges. Um, yeah, that, that's, really, that's really the challenge, not just having a large number of qubits, but having these qubits um, be of sufficient quality that they can stay or they can maintain their coherence, maintain their quantum state or quantum nature mm -hmm. over a long enough time that you can actually do the computations that you want to do. Um, so, yeah, I guess the Google group, for example, is working on actually a 72 qubit quantum computer right now, which is one of the biggest in the world. Um, and yeah, they are you know, probably working as we speak, um, <laughs> <laughs> even though it's getting a bit late, yeah. uh, on improving or characterizing um, really how that quantum computer is doing. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, that's, yeah. So yeah, there's, there's this trade-off or balance between having a lot of qubits and having them be of high quality. Um, and you really need to match both, uh, both those metrics. You need a lot of qubits and you also need high quality qubits. And yeah. in some sense, that's what makes it mm -hmm. so challenging. Yeah, and probably we'll drop some links in the description for you, those of you who are interested about knowing more. It's, it's, a, it's a very advanced concept. So you can just watch a YouTube video and then become an expert in quantum computing. You probably need a lot of time. And speaking of this, what, what's your life story? How did you get into, into the, one of the most advanced fields in the world right now? So my path, I guess, was kind of indirect, actually. Um, so in undergrad, um, I actually didn't work at all on quantum computing. Um, so I did my undergrad in physics, um, but the stuff that I worked on at that point was mostly things about, um, I guess, the quantum nature of light uh, and also about how light interacts with matter, um, kind of, uh, yeah, like quantum interactions between light and matter. Um, and when I started grad school, I actually, or even before that, when I was applying to grad schools, actually, um, I guess computer science for me for a long time had been something I'd been interested in, but um, never really spent as much time on as I liked. So actually, I thought actually of applying to computer science grad schools, um, but I guess I just felt like I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be as good an applicant for computer science as I was for a physics PhD program. Um, and so basically, soon after I started uh, grad school in physics, I, I kind of thought about this a little bit more. You and mean grad school, like master's or PhD? PhD. Okay. 
yeah so so you started the phd without being in the quantum uh, computing domain yeah so some of the stuff that i did was um kind of slightly linked to quantum computing mm -hmm. um like i i used to work on some things that could be applied to quantum computing but um I didn't work on those applications. Um, so that helped me a little bit. Like I had a little bit of background um, with things that are kind of relevant to quantum computing, but not directly quantum computing. Um, but so yeah, when I started grad school, I kind of thought a little bit more about this and I thought, well, you know, I'm in a physics PhD program. What can I do to be a little bit closer to computer science or to do some of these things that I've been, I guess, interested in for a long time. Um, and very luckily there was actually there was actually a professor at my university who did work that combined these things, who worked on yeah, algorithms for quantum computers, uh, specifically for simulating physics and chemistry. So I started with his group and, uh, you know, it's been great ever since. Oh, okay. I've yeah, been able to combine my interests pretty luckily and, mm -hmm. yeah. And what, what's your advice? Uh, and also, what, what's your what's your intuition about the domain? Do you think the number of people who will work in this domain will grow? And d what would you advise someone who's watching this video to do in order to get a better understanding? And if he's interested in the domain, why, what does he need to do in order to uh, get accepted into those kind of, I, into those kind of groups, which I am imagine that they're like super hard to get in. Yeah, so I definitely think, I definitely think quantum computing is going to be on the upswing um, definitely for a while. It might be, it's it's hard to say if it'll be a slower upswing at first. Like, there's always this kind of balance of, I guess, especially with a field like quantum computing, you have to watch out for getting overhyped. Um, but I would say that if you were trying to get into quantum computing, um, well, it's actually interesting. I think it's something that it'll become easier to get into as time goes on where a lot of universities now are kind of slowly starting to develop programs or you know undergraduate programs that combine some of the things you would need for quantum computing so it, there's a lot of there's a lot of linking between things in physics math computer science uh, electrical engineering um, where you can you know you can kind of combine a little bit to get into quantum computing um, so basically you need to go into college to, to do that yeah definitely I, I think definitely it would be it's something that's definitely a lot easier to do especially as an undergraduate student um, I don't think there's a particular direction that you have to go to get into it but um, definitely definitely I think that really physics yeah physics computer science and electrical engineering are probably some of the easiest ways mm -hmm. to get there um, all of these programs in different ways give you a bit of different exposure um, to the field. I've actually, I've actually heard interestingly from some people that, you know, their undergraduate algorithms classes now have like a little two week thing on quantum computing. So I think there are a lot of different ways that you can get into it. Before ending the video, I want, I have a very interesting question for me. I'm very interested in the answer. So you're as a researcher when were some moments when you feel like your mind like expanded do you, do you know what i'm talking about like some kind of revelations or what are some concepts that you found very interesting after you understood them what were your biggest breakthroughs so my my biggest breakthroughs in understanding something uh whatever you want understanding or discovering new things it's up to you i think i, I think for me some of it is some of it really comes down to, I guess, almost like, like small mathematical details. Like, I guess some of the stuff that I tend to be most proud of is, one of them is definitely like, like really understanding some proof of something. Like there's some, I guess, especially for some of the stuff I do, I think some of the stuff can be a little bit tricky to get through. And, you know, you, you kind of bang your head on the desk for a while, but um, really once you get to the point that you like, get through the end of reading some I guess research paper or something and actually realizing that you do understand it is um, I, I think for me that's definitely a really good feeling um, the second thing that I actually like a lot and that I've been you know doing a little bit today actually is basically I guess or something that I really do enjoy is implementing some of these things in code that I work on mm -hmm. um, wait can you can you can you execute your code on a quantum computer <laughs> so at this point, it's it's 
it's hard to execute your code on a quantum computer. There are actually um, there are actually some uh, devices that you can actually access online. Um, so actually, IBM has uh, I think a five at least a five qubit quantum computer that you can access you know from your home and you can run experiments on. Um, I think they also have a larger one, maybe. 15 qubits or so that you can also I think actually use for free online we'll drop links in the description yeah um, so me personally um, I actually I actually have once run um, some things of mine on a very small quantum computer um, so I, that means that you're in that <laughs> elite society <laughs> elite group of people like hundred people around the world who executed code on a quantum computer yeah so so yeah we actually did a like a I, I mean I, I would hesitate to call it code because we're 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 not really at the stage with the quantum computers where it's it, it has such a kind of direct translation from you know typing something like Python to running code on a quantum computer there are still you know there are still a bunch of steps and you really need a lot of help from um, the experimental people who work more directly with the quantum computers for a lot of these things, um, but yeah, actually, what I what I did for that was um, actually a, a very small um, simulation of the hydrogen molecule on a quantum computer, um, and this was this was just it was really a very small thing, like it was just three qubits, but um, you know <laughs> we we got the energies of uh, the hydrogen molecule correct, so. It was it was actually very nice in that sense. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times we get trapped but by not by wanting the bigger things, but a lot of times the progress comes from these small steps. Like imagine when electricity was discovered and they were able to like light up the first light bulb. It was bigger than a lot of discoveries now because without that we wouldn't been able to, to reach this point. And you're talking about um about uh, reading things and understanding them. How is your everyday job at Google? Because I suppose it's very different compared to mine as a software engineer where I just sit in front of a computer and write code. So I guess it, it varies a bit. Um, so yeah, I would say my day-to-day my -day varies a little bit. So right now what I'm working on, um, I actually, I mean, the, the past day or two, I have been working mostly on code. Um, but this is, yeah, it's it's code that I'm using to run um, some calculations that, you know, help me understand some of the algorithms I'm working on. Um, but a lot of the work that I do is more, um, I guess, research-oriented. Like, it's theory or theoretical work that I'm doing with a pen and paper rather than on my computer. Um, so I think I think it's actually very nice when I have the ability to balance between these two things and not get not get too much on either direction like I I, I don't personally I, I don't want to be spending you know absolutely a hundred percent of my time writing code but on the other hand I don't want to spend a hundred percent of my time doing like this very pure research yeah. stuff with you know no yeah I, I, I like having the code component I like having a little bit of the component where I'm kind of sitting down and just thinking about what I'm doing for a little bit as well mm -hmm. so thanks a lot I hope uh, we got your interest and we'll drop a lot of links in the description um, feel free to check them out don't feel discouraged if you don't understand things from the first try or the second try how many times should they read something until that they are allowed to quit and saying, okay, this is not for me. I don't understand this. <laughs> I guess it, it'll depend on, hopefully we can have, you know, some links that you can only read through once and, you know, things will be clear from there. Um, but yeah, I mean, really understanding things, I think you really have to read through a lot. Um, I would say that, you know, for me, there are a lot of things that I've read through you know five or ten times and not fully understood or not fully appreciated um so i think i think that's fine though i think it's it's something that you read through once you understand a little bit more you read through a second time and you get a little bit more on top of that and it, it's something where you can almost spend as much time on it as you want but mm -hmm. each time you get a little bit more out of it you learn a little bit more so yeah. i think that's that's kind of the way and that i would think of it and right. also 
close your social networks and all the chats while you're reading it. I know, I know, Jan is very hard to <laughs> reach. Like I asked for this interview a lot of times, and like I understand your work is yeah. complicated. It's complicated, and you need to disconnect. And that's one big advice I have for everyone who tries to learn even computer science, which is way easier than than quantum computing and quantum physics. Just Whenever you're learning, whenever you're reading something, just disconnect completely. Have no interruptions. Yeah, cut off distractions and really focus on what you're working on. Right. Yeah. Okay, so until next time, don't forget to hit the like button if you learned new things from this video. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. There is a lot more content coming up. Um, I wish you all the best. I wish you have a successful career. Don't forget to read everything that will drop in the description and especially don't forget to ask comments whenever you're not understanding something. We will try to answer your questions and help you as much as possible. And until next time, we wish you all the best. Mm -hmm.